Well, Dan, welcome to the show, man. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, glad to be part of it and glad to meet you and um, have a good conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And I know we've been putting this together for some time. Um, what it looks like you're back home. Uh, surely, I know you've been traveling, but with all the yeah. uh, <laughs> stuff on the wall back there. <laughs> yeah, this is this is my hotel room, unfortunately. So <laughs> you got a dead elk. It looks like you trap. I'm gonna just assume. I, I I do. I run a wildlife control business and a predator control side of it, and and have for well the better part of my adult life about thirty seven years. So. Uh, and so it's 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 all encompassing for everything. We do a, a human animal conflict resolution business, and uh, that's not just trapping skunks and squirrels. It, it's it's actually uh, habitat modification and uh, endangered species issues, and and dealing with uh, power plants and public utility type stuff. Uh, Department of Defense, just a whole variety of things. So I've got an intimate knowledge of the landscape. I don't have a degree. I'm not a scientist, but I've got anecdotal experience over the lifespan of about 35 generations of animals and mm -hmm. two generations of me. So what is the, what animal do you get called to deal with the most frequently? <clears throat> well, because we specialize in things that other people don't want to do, <clears throat> a lot of what we do is birds, uh, bird mm -hmm. mitigation. You look at power plants and, and water facilities and, and, uh, you know, flight bird strike flight programs and stuff at, at uh, small airports. Uh, people don't think about that stuff because it's not normally at their location. But you don't want pigeons hanging around the the uh, flight for life landing pad at hospitals uh, when you got turbojet helicopters coming in and out. Uh, you don't want pigeons taking up occupancy at power plants. And you don't want geese living on open water uh, reservoirs for water treatment facilities. And, and we do a lot of other stuff. But... Uh, it, it takes all of that to be able to kind of round out our business. And it's not what we had started with when I started 37 years ago, but it's, it's where we're at, ended up now. And, and that's, uh, you know, ever since the, uh, Sully Sullenberg deal on the, on the uh, Hudson river where they, you know, landed the plane there after they sucked the geese in there, bird yeah. strike is a major, major, major issue. And, uh, and so are the health and safety side of things when you get into bird mitigation at all these other locations. Yeah, I don't. I think it was on the way back from. Uh, gosh, where was I? I don't know. It was this hunting season. I was somewhere up north. I don't remember where. Uh, but our flight was delayed. It was an American Airlines flight. It was delayed three hours because the incoming plane had a bird strike. And yep, they, had, I, they didn't say the engine was out, but they're like, we can't risk it. We have to make sure everything's kosher before yeah. we can <laughs> obviously go. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, that was the first time I, that had ever affected me personally um but uh it, airline travel these days is just a, become such a nightmare I just... yeah i left salt lake city yesterday morning flew to vegas and then flew in the colorado springs and and uh you know if 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 people would pay attention they don't see very many birds at airports mm -hmm. and and there's a reason for that because there's there's a control effort to make sure that birds don't hang around airports mm -hmm. uh and uh, there's a human health and safety side of it. So even the people that gripe about our way of life, Cable, uh, you know, as far as, as conflict resolution or animal consumption or whatever it is, they benefit off of the control measures so we can live on the landscape safely. And uh, and there's efforts that go on behind the scenes that people just don't ever think about and realize. Oftentimes lethal measures. Oftentimes lethal measures. There's a lot of deterrent, a lot of repellent. But I mean, uh, you look at Offutt Air Force Base in in central Nebraska. You know, it's it sits in the in the central flyway of migratory waterfowl, and you look at all around it, and it's it's swamps and wetlands and riparian areas, and and millions and millions and millions and millions of birds go through there. Uh, deterrent measures are a main priority in locations like that, and and sometimes lethal measures need to be employed. But you know, for the, these people that we're fighting against every day, it's you know out of sight, out of mind. They don't want to think about that. They don't want to recognize that that's reality so that they can continue to exist in their yeah. poshy little, you know, realm of whatever, whatever reality they've chosen to exist in that day. I mean, just because you go to Whole Foods, we know things die that supply Whole Foods, but there's also a control measure as far as pest and rodents 
uh, you know, insects and rodents. You don't want cockroaches running around the warehouse part of Whole Foods. You don't want mice uh, peeing and pooping on top of all your, your you know, grass-fed beef. Mm -hmm. uh, and those things happen. People don't often recognize it. They don't notice it because uh, they don't get to see the behind-the-scenes stuff. But it's part of supplying a human population with a food source um, as, as safely as what we possibly can. And uh, everybody benefits off of what everything happens behind the scenes. It's just that sometimes those people that benefit are still trying to fight it because they don't think that you know they're part of that whole system, which they are. Well, I'll give you just a, a Texas example. Like the average anti-hunter gets all bent out of shape if they see a video or see a pile of feral hogs that were shot out of a helicopter in agricultural land, right? But exactly. Yeah, probably the animal rights activists, most of them, are vegan or vegetarian anyway. So it's like, hey, these pigs are eating your food. Yep. I mean, what do you – you got to eat, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. this, is the, uh, this is the reality. But they don't – you know, again, out of mind, out of sight. Out of sight, yeah. out of mind. They don't. They don't want to. They don't want to recognize that that actually happens. And there's tons but, of other examples too, but that's one that's close to home for me. Hospitals, nursing homes, food service, um, uh, elementary and, and preschool locations. Uh, you know, uh, grain storage bins, and and the, I mean, it's everything that we do that we that we feed ourselves with. Doesn't matter what. Something out there wants to eat what we have, but but the thing is, they pee and poop and leave diseases on the stuff that we have. So there needs right. to be a control measure. It's not like, oh, well, they deserve to eat as well. Yeah, well, they do, maybe, but but uh, I'd, I'd rather not eat a bunch of mouse turds and and uh, and have a bunch of mouse pee all over the top eat of my them. stuff. I don't want them in my deer camper. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, geez. Yeah. <laughs> um, so where are you from originally, Dan? Originally uh, born in Missouri, lived in mm -hmm. Colorado since 1974. Um, so I'm an old fart and um have have operated this business started it 37 years ago my son and i operate it now wife is the main manager we've got a few employees during the summer that help us out on occasion and uh, but it's it's essentially a two to a four man operation year round mm -hmm. and what i do on the side for politics and and advocacy work has turned into a a full time i won't say avocation but a full time nightmare <laughs> right and uh and and it's taking you know literally and it's not an exaggeration cable i mean um uh, you know 80 to 90 hours a week at this level because the animal activists the extremists continually try to assault everything that we do for wildlife management it doesn't matter whether it's the control efforts that i do on one side of my business or the 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 sustainable science-based management of of hunting and fishing they're after it and they want to take it all away no matter what they don't care about it uh just stop it yeah um, well, I know you just got back from Western Hunt Expo and yes, sir. I mean, just to put into perspective, like how much in demand you are on the, let's say the outdoor podcast or talk show circuit. I mean, you, you did like seven podcasts while you were there. I was there two days, did seven podcasts. I walked the floor once and never got to maybe 20% of it. Uh -huh. not because of a celebrity status so much, but because people recognized who we were and what we were doing. And I say, we, I was with Charles Whitwam with Howl for Wildlife and Mike Costello and John Stallone. And so that was the hub of our, of our, you know, home base, but I was getting pulled, you know, 30 different directions uh, for a variety of good reasons, but it's, a, it's remarkable to me over the last four and a half months of how many people have started to pay attention to the issues that we're having to deal with, not only here in Colorado, but they're starting to pay attention, pay, pay attention a little bit on, on their own local level and go, well, I didn't know that was happening. Oh, I just yeah. met my state legislator. Oh, I went to our first commission meeting and, and, and it's, it's, it's kind of inspiring on my end to think that I'm inspiring enough people to pay attention on their local stuff to help contribute on our side to help us defeat the measures here. So it's, yeah. You know, anybody that's never been to that Western Hunt Expo, um, it's a remarkable setup. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was fortunate enough to do a, a presentation at a press conference with Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation at the SHOT Show in Vegas. Uh, you know, that's 
a hundred thousand attendees with you know thirty five hundred vendors from around the world, and it's a shooting hunting outdoor trade show for somebody who doesn't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then right before that, I was fortunate enough to be invited to go to the Wild Sheep Foundation show, uh, where they auctioned off a hunt that was donated to us uh, that brought fifty thousand dollars that went to this cause. So I'm I, I, I've been a show guru the last six weeks and. I'm normally trapping this time of year doing agricultural <laughs> damage work. And, and I haven't done shows for 25 years. And now mm-hmm. I've got some sort of notoriety to fame because I'm trying to fight the antis and we're doing a fairly good job on the first several rounds of the 15 round bout. Right. Right. Well, and I don't, I'm not going to pat myself on the back. Um, but I am going to say, and originally I caught flack for this because it's called the Lone Star Outdoor Show when I started it. Guess what? I only hunted and fished in Texas for the most part, a little bit in New Mexico 15 years ago. And then I started to expand my horizons and put in for Western draws and started traveling internationally. And, and very quickly, early on in, in this uh, endeavor, realized all of it's connected. And what happens in Washington State or California or New Jersey, whatever, that mindset is just going to bleed into middle America. It's going to start on the coast and it's going to bleed in. And people originally were like, why why are you not, why are we just talking? Why are we talking about just Texas stuff? And I was like, because if you don't, if you pay attention, it's coming for all of us. And so, you know, obviously I've spent quite a bit of time hunting in Colorado, but I already had a vested interest in that because if we lose, you know, if we lose the mountain lion thing in Colorado, they're not stopping there. No. And then the next stop, what is New Mexico going to say? Well, I mean, New Mexico is a very poor state. And they're very blue leaning. And they're going to be like, well, wait, if Colorado did it, well, let's try to do it here. You know, yep. they're going to look what Big Brother did. Yep. And uh, and so it, it, it affects all of us. And and that's why for the longest time I've been preaching, like, anytime these things come up, hey, we, we need to take note as not Texans, but as outdoor enthusiasts from all over, not just the United States, all over the globe. And we're fighting it internationally on every front, you know? Um, and and who would have thought that Coloradans for Responsible Wildlife Management would have become the face of what I think is de- the face of defending the most pressing issue we're going to face as sportsmen in 2024, for sure. There's no doubt in my mind. Yeah, and, and I appreciate you saying that. Um, when we formulated in 2017 it was because we saw the need to do something proactively at the time knowing that our gubernatorial landscape was going to change significantly and um and i and i got to preface that with you know i was appointed by by governor hickenlooper to sit on the senate confirmed habitat stamp committee which is sportsmen and women dollars that go into conservation easements and right-of-ways and and habitat protection and stuff and i was subsequently reappointed by this governor and I didn't vote for either one of them but but the value that I brought to the landscape from representation on the sportsman side put me in behind the scenes at different things that were happening coupled with all the other stuff that I was involved in and I won't name all the the groups or the the coalitions or the committees that I'd been appointed to but um I saw myself and my a friend of mine by the name of Chris Journey saw a need that we better get our crap together and look a little bit harder on how to be proactive as opposed to reactive. So when we formulated this organization in 2017, we decided to to make it a 501c4, which is if you donate to it, it's not tax deductible. And it puts us in a little bit different structure than a C3 like Rocky Mountain Elk or Mule Deer or any of the others. Those are all C3 organizations. They have a limitation on what they can actually expend on advocacy and lobbying type work. And we, we have a limitation too, but we can be much more structured through education and lobbying and advocacy on political issues. Well, when Governor Polis got elected in 2018, and immediately you could see the landscape change overnight like a like a shift in a gravitational pull from from some sort of you know volcanic fault or something. And uh his husband um uh, is a an extreme animal rights activist yeah. see i didn't know this we had on naomi hirsch from uh, sportsman's alliance a couple yeah. weeks ago which i told you in an email and she told me that and i was like i mean i knew governor polis was anti-hunting right but i didn't realize yeah. it was his husband yeah. that is essentially running the anti-hunting movement behind the mm-hmm. scenes in colorado yep 
Yeah, mm. R- not only running it, uh, in my opinion, has got the 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 ship's captain's hat on when it comes to who, when, why, what, where, and how. Now, Governor Polis makes the decisions in finality, but uh, the times that I've had minimal interactions with the governor, he seems like a reasonable individual. He's smart. Um, he's well structured in his political, you know, background and politics and, and views and stuff. His husband, in my opinion, um, is just, is an extreme individual when it comes to these issues and the contacts and the people that they bring in to play for their wishes, wants, and desires are nothing other than other extremists. And, you know, the appointments that they make and the positions and the policies and the, and the, the, the procedures and stuff. I tell you what, if people, if people had this in their state, they would shiver and think maybe we ought to move somewhere. Uh, and I've thought that many, many times, but I, but I've got a chip on my shoulder and I don't want to pack my stuff up and start over from scratch after, you know, an adult life of trying to build not an empire, but it's a, it's a, it's a good livelihood. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the, the opposition that is in our capital at this point in time, for the most part, you know, our legislature is made up primarily of Democrats. Uh, we're at 49 to 16 in the house and 23 to 12 in the Senate. All the other elected offices are all all blue, and I'm not saying all Democrats are bad anti hunters and animal rights extremists, but okay, but, but it's 99 percent of anti hunting legislation is introduced by Democrats. And exactly, just, it is what it is. Is it exactly? The People interesting get thing when is when I say that too, because there are Democrat hunters, and I'm like, dude, I don't understand. It's like a you're a walking contradiction, in my opinion, and I'll, I'll say it. I do yeah. not give a crap. If you're a Democrat hunter, you need to do some self reflecting and figure out what's more important to you. You're your pastime, your right to hunt and fish, the the right, uh, your Second Amendment rights, or these social issues. I mean, right. what's more important to you? And right. for me, it's it's black and white. Like it didn't even. So I always I always struggle with that. And I look at who's running for governor of Montana and Ryan Bussey and the fraud that he is. Mm-hmm. And it's like you live in a over a million dollar house and you come out with all these socialist views. Like you worked for Kimber, made an amazing life for yourself, and then you come out and write this damn book that vilifies and says that, uh, you know, the, the firearm industry radicalized and racialized America. Give me a break. And then he shows yeah. videos. It, I, I reposted one of his videos recently. It's him and his son shooting trap. And he's like, this is what real Montanans do. Uh-huh. But, like, on the what he doesn't tell you in the video is, oh, by the way, if you elect me, we're going to try to take away your ARs. He's this, exactly. the same as Beto, who's yeah. running here in Texas, who's exactly. on record as saying, Hell yeah, I'll take their AR-15. Yeah. The same dude. <laughs> yeah, and and what's interesting, Cable is is uh, the statistics I gave about forty nine to sixteen and twenty three to twelve. Ab- ab- about fifty five percent of the entire state of Colorado uh, classifies themselves as independents, unaffiliated, mm-hmm. and so 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 they're voting one side or the other. They might say they're unaffiliated, but they're voting Democratic because yeah. look at the people that we've got in that are that are actually you know running the ship and so if we had unaffiliated or independent legislators there might not be so much bias but they have to they have to cater to one side or the other because that's the way the political structure has been you know they'll eat their own if you get out of line oh yeah yeah so what, what let me ask you this on a side note what happened to colorado what happened to it like how did he how do we get to this point there's a, it, didn't, it didn't used to be like this. It used to be a proud Western state. Yeah, there's there's uh there was a there was a concept that was initiated actually by this governor when he was a, f- a federal congressman. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a book called The Blueprint, and and it's 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 how how the Democrats changed Colorado is is what it was, and it started in in around 2000 when we had Governor Owens, who at that time was a Republican, the last Republican we've had, and I think we've only had one Republican governor in the last 46 years or something. Uh, but it started to change significantly. And it's in, and they laid out a plan of action to get their ducks in a row, to get the right pieces in place, get the right people in those places, and start to carry out their wants, wishes, and desires. And now that he's been governor since 2018, and this all started around 2000, you and it's and it's not it's not it's a, it's an incremental recollection 
of of what happened. It's not what is going to happen. It wasn't a pro. If they had wrote it back then, it'd have been a prophecy. Yeah. But but this is a compilation of this is why we got to where we're at, and this is who helped them put it in place, and this is where it's going to go if we don't stop it. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think it is the result of more preying on 18 to 25 year olds in their vote or an influx of out of staters moving in from the West coast, California. I think there's a, there's a, a significant part that's that, and it's not, it's really 18 to 34. Okay. Uh, but you stop and think that in, in 2000, you know, a 34 year old was, you know, what, 10 or 12 or whatever the hell. Uh, and the, the preparation of, long time sustainable management of their objectives. Um, I, I think some of it's that 18 to, to 34 year old crowd, but a lot of it is the ideologies that have moved into this state. I mean, you know, look, look back in 1996 when we lost trapping on, on, a, a, on a constitutional amendment, uh, we lost that by 52 to 48% that we had 2.9 million people in the state. Then we got 5.9 million people now. So whatever whatever smoke and mirrors that was thrown out there then with the Democratic governor, which was Governor Romer at the time, and then you get up into today's landscape, uh, we, we've gone through we've gone through four governors since that transition in '96. You gain three million people. The majority of them come from you know more liberally minded states because everybody wants to move to Colorado and hike the mountains and and camp Smoke and drink weed. clean water and recreate and you know have good tech jobs and 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 you know get the Rocky Mountain high no matter how that is whether it's Coors <laughs> or marijuana or whatever right. you know and and I, things started to change significantly in my mind about 2008 although there was the two ballot initiatives that happened in 92 on the bears and 96 on the on the trapping okay is the bears in 92 when Houndsman lost that yeah, the, the, so they took out spring bear hunting and hounds and baiting in 1992. Okay, okay. Uh, that so was I've initiative two. Colorado uh, for mountain lion with hounds, uh-huh. and uh, and we were in Rangeley, so close to the Utah border. And he would have his buddy from Utah come over, my, my houndsman, and his dogs weren't broken off bears. The Utah guy, because they could still run, you know, uh-huh. bears in Utah. But then my Colorado buddy, he was like, "My dogs don't do that because it's been illegal here for." since I've been doing this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, that's that we, we, we held things at bay. I was going to say we held the wolves at bay, which was literal <laughs> until, until 2020, uh, right. when, when another citizens initiative about initiative, um, that was stricken that, you know, they, they brought it in, uh, the voters voted on it. It was 51.9% to 49.1%, um, that we lost. And, uh, most recently here in December, they just released 10 wolves and to go back to the concept of what we talked about early in the two thousands. And whether you talk about 18 to 25 year olds or 34 year olds, Mm -hmm. there was a naming contest for the wolves that they turn around and, and, and let go in December. So these, these middle schoolers got to turn around and name the wolves. So as they released impact a young person's mind more than, Oh, we got to name fluffy. Yeah, so oh, so Fluffy just ate eighteen elk in a month, and 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 this rancher just killed Fluffy. So now yeah. the rancher is going to be villainized for protecting his livestock under a ten J rule because he killed Fluffy or Tonto or Maverick or whatever the hell they decided to name him. You know, I used to never say, and and I would, I'm not advising anyone to violate game laws, but on that level, what's what's happened with you have Denver and uh, Boulder dictating to ranchers who, you know can't afford to lose livestock to predators that they can't manage i don't blame them as well i'm gonna i'm just leave it as leave it at that but of course they're probably all collared so it's like how do you how well they're all collared that? and and you're looking at you're looking at uh, i feel sorry for the first rancher that actually takes matters into his own hand even though the law allows him to do so in some specific uh you know with some specific requirements it essentially says that that the wolf has to have a calf or a sheep in its mouth uh, not 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 stalking it, not wandering through the herd, not you know going on the periphery, not you know coming he's just in there close, hanging out. He, yeah, yeah he's just, just there. yeah. So, but <laughs> but the first guy that actually feels compelled to shoot, he's not going to shoot and shovel and shut up because there's a collar on it. Yeah, and and it, it they can be they can be jailed and fined up to a quarter of a million dollars uh, because it's an endangered species and 
And and the bad part about that is even if he was 100% justified, in my mind, because we've allowed these kids to name him, then that, that rancher is going to be vilified in the court of public opinion by the people that voted for Wolves, even though he was fully justified, no matter what the outcome of that instance was. Let me ask you this. After, you know, the ballot initiative, fast forward to 2024, if you took that vote again, do you think it would still pass? I, would, it, would it change at all? Or I mean, has the, has the education and science-based wildlife management ideology actually gotten into the brains of some of these morons that voted in favor of it? I think there's a certain amount of the population that might have some questions about their check mark on the box, or they might have had a little bit of buyer's remorse given the last four years of publicity and negativity that has flowed into this that actually has probably given the bulk of the population more education than what was previously done before the ballot. Mm -hmm. If you guys as an organization had a full head of steam like you do right now back in 2020, do you think that would have made a difference? Okay, now you're putting my head on the chopping block here because so so before people want to start I didn't letters. know you existed, and I was I was paying very close attention to that. Yeah, you know, talking with Aaron Snyder and a lot of other Coloradans and oh, yeah. a, about that back in 2020, and I never had heard of Coloradans for responsible wildlife management. And, and the, the reason being is because we were we were we were the only organization in the state, even today, that has full time lobbying representation on sportsmen and women hunting and angling issues. There's not another organization that does. All, all the groups that I'm a member of, they don't. They help buy into a coalition that we formulated called the Colorado Wildlife Conservation Project, but they don't They don't have a lobbyist at the Capitol full-time. We've got three. The reason I say that and preface that is there was about 30 different things on the landscape that we, we, we were dealing with in 2018, 19, 20 that we were dealing with at the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Commission and the Colorado General Legislature Assembly. If we would have gotten involved in the wolf deal, not only would we have divided and conquered our own resources for the issues that we were dealing with at the Capitol and the Commission, mm -hmm. we didn't have the bandwidth or the money to turn around and do both because we were doing everything on this side and the anti-wolf guys or the Stop the Wolf Coalition and Colorado and Protecting Wildlife that was formulated, they were doing the wolf deal, but they weren't doing anything on our side. Mm -hmm. And so we felt it best at that time to not divide and conquer our, our particular resources and sacrifice everything that we were accomplishing and capitalizing on at the commission level and at the legislative level. And, and that came out to be in our favor of about 30 different issues. Okay, we didn't engage in the wolf deal. If we would have engaged in the wolf deal, we could have won maybe, but I know we would have lost all the other stuff. So it's mm -hmm. it was a give and take. Where do we where where do we put our resources? and our team and our armament together because we weren't we weren't established well enough after a couple of years. And granted, I've been playing on this landscape here for 19 years, but the organization was only formed in 2017. Yeah. I wasn't willing to step into both wheelhouses and go, let's spread ourselves so thin that we don't win anything. We have to concentrate on what we're doing and let the other guys do what they're doing. Okay. Okay. Um, what do you, what do you like to hunt the most, Dan? If it flies, walks, slithers, crawls, it's so we're really we're of the same ilk in, in that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've <laughs> I've, I've been mindset. fortunate enough in my adult life. I've uh, you know I've I've traveled abroad. Uh, I've I've hunted multiple states. Uh, I guided here. I, I've trapped here all my life. I run a wildlife control business, as I said. Um, I've got a wall full of of what could people could consider to be trophies what i would look at is a lot of what i've got on the wall is is the hard stuff that wasn't edible out of the stuff that i harvested uh right. you know if i could and my dog would think it was edible you know mm -hmm. i mean you know he'd, he'd love to get the antlers uh but uh i i like hunting elk i like hunting you know big mature mule deer uh but i just like the pursuit i like the 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 being outside with nature i like uh the the preparation what I will tell you, though, I'm not liking it as much the last 10 years because of the politics and the crap that I have to do to be able to defend everybody else's opportunity and privilege 
and 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 b- provide some logic and reason to the landscape. Because this past year, my son and I hunted Nebraska for two days, and we hunted elk here for three days, and that's that was our hunting. Uh, because wow. I'm fighting this crap because we're doing all of this stuff. Um, so, Man. yeah, mm. I don't envy so, that. Yeah. Well, and and I wanted to ask you that because as an out of stater who has spent money and spends buys points in Colorado every year. And if I've hunted over the counter elk and I've hunted mule deer and, you know, I, I think about if the, if the mountain lion thing passes and now we have two apex predators on the landscape with, you know, no management whatsoever. And yeah. the wolves are going to populate way faster than people realize. I mean, we've seen it in Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho. Uh, like, I don't know that I'll spend my money in Colorado anymore. I'll probably burn the points that I have and just stop, stop. Because, I mean, the writing's on the wall. What's what's going to happen is those elk and mule deer, those servant herds, are going to go to crap. Right. And and I and you probably have the, the actual number. But I did the research. Um, it was a while back. But, I mean, isn't it something over $70 million that out-of-staters contribute to Colorado Parks and Wildlife through their licenses every year, like annually? Depend it, it fluctuates and it depends on how you how you quantify that because of application fees and yeah. qualifying licenses and stuff. But but a rough statistic is is around fifty eight percent of all the game cash that goes into the Colorado Parks and Wildlife on the game side of it is is from non resident elk hunters, mm-hmm. non resident elk hunters, not deer hunters, sheep hunters, and small game hunters. And That's if, just it's, the elk. Yeah, yeah, just the elk. Yeah, yeah. the non resident so elk hunter provides the bulk of the funding for the programs. Uh, uh, and some of that's just because of the cost of the licenses, but it's just uh, the the amount of people that we allow to come in here because we've got the largest elk elk herd in the world. Mm-hmm. But that's gonna that will change. I mean, and I, yeah. and I don't want it to change. I want to keep coming to Colorado. But if I the first time I go to Colorado, I was like, oh, there's no elk here. Oh, I wonder why. I used mm-hmm. to see elk here ten years ago, mm-hmm. but they're gone now. Yeah, well, financially, that's gonna. Well, it's going to have a profound impact on Colorado Parks and Wildlife. And 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 to that point, I mean, I, I said this on one of the podcasts over the weekend. I say it frequently, but um, 91% of all elk hunters, resident, non-resident, bull, cow, guided, unguided, private land, public land, you know, you name it, 91% are unsuccessful. There's a 9% success rate now with the largest elk herd in the world, and and elk are not easy to harvest. You know, that some of that might be because a guy saw a four point and he was waiting for something bigger, or maybe they were too far away and he didn't get a chance to get on it. Maybe they were on public private land, or maybe he was on private land with a private land only tag. And then they were on public land and you know how that works. Oh, and yeah. it, it doesn't matter where you're at. They're never in the right spot. So it's 91% unsuccessful, 9% that are successful, but a hundred percent are paying for the opportunity right. to make sure that we have the largest elk herd on the planet and that we've got a good sustainable population that to your point, one apex predator is going to grow in population and start to, at some point in time, diminish uh, populations of those ungulates, whether it's antelope or elk or mule deer or whatever. If we stop harvesting mountain lions, that's only going to exacerbate the the speed of that decline and in specific areas, depending on where you go and what you do, and if it's whatever time of the year, you could actually have mountain lions and wolves competing at such a level because it's not like elk are spread out over the entire state, especially in the winter, because everything goes in specific locations through their migration patterns. They don't do that like that back east. you know. So when somebody mm-hmm. says, you know, what do you mean your, your deer migrate? I mean, deer migrate, yeah. especially in the majority parts of the state. They don't migrate. They might move off of a 40-acre ranch in Ohio or a farm in Ohio, but but they don't migrate to Indiana. You know, my, uh, my whitetail on my deer lease migrate from one feeder to the next. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> you know, Year-round. And, they, and they're still hard to kill. Like, yeah. I mean, I st- the big bucks, I mean, like they, sometimes they avoid the feeder like you know, feeders like the plague. But, I oh, mean, yeah. that's to, it's a just an example. Like, we don't – our deer don't migrate here. They, no. Throw you know, wolves and mountain mean, lions in there and see how they migrate. <laughs> right? Well, we have we are fighting that. I mean, there's this group called Texans for Mountain Lions, and I went down not this August. or the, It was about 18 months ago. I went to the commission meeting in Austin and spoke out against 
they're it's basically the California mindset of uh, we don't manage we currently don't manage mountain lions in Texas, and, for, and somehow mm-hmm. we still have more mountain lions than anyone wants to admit. Yep, and uh, you know more deer hunters start they're, they're, the most of them that you see killed are shot by deer hunters that where the the cats become used to stalking a feeder. Mm-hmm. Well, okay, mm-hmm. there's a buffet there every day, right? Exactly. Um, yeah. And but this group wants to start with trapping right and and impose seasons and make mm-hmm. them a managed well what what, what happens next Dan? yeah they don't stop there yeah they don't stop there okay now we now we are going to in five years it might be five years it might be 10 years but whenever they feel they have enough momentum they're going to say you know what trapping isn't good enough seasons we don't really like that because their whole mantra and they all talk about this behind closed doors is how can we ban the killing of mountain lions yep because it hurts our feelings well, you look at um, 1965 was the first time that mountain lions in the state of Colorado were designated as a big game animal. Up until then, they were they were a nuisance. They were they were a you know a a, a conflict animal that the ranchers didn't want to have on the landscape, just like what they didn't want lions and bears and wolves all combined. Uh, but they made him a big game animal. There was roughly they they guess around 200 in the state in '65. There's roughly 5,000 in now, with hunting, with regulated hunting, you know, sixty years later, um, well, fifty-five years later, we've got we've got five thousand mountain lions compared to two hundred. Right. We got we don't have as many deer and elk as what we used to. That's not I'm not attributing that to mountain lions and bears. Some of that is mountain lions and bears, but we've got four million more people now on the landscape than what we had then, and loss of habitat and the infrastructure. I mean, it's just Things ha- things have changed dramatically since 1965 when mountain lions were designated big game that we have to recognize the successes with all the other components that we can't control. We can't control human growth. We can't right. control development. We're not going to control all the urban sprawl and the infrastructure to make sure that we all have a place to live and, and eat and recreate. And I mean, look at my ski areas were on the freaking landscape in 1965 in Colorado. Not very damn many. Now you can't go anywhere without getting in ski traffic in the middle of the wintertime. Mm-hmm. And it's year round use of the landscape for recreational opportunities. But we have 5,000 mountain lions compared to what we used to have 55 years ago. And that's with a highly regulated season structure to manage for those mountain lions and other predatory and prey species. So I think a, an important point to make here is the way that they go about painting us as sportsmen. Okay. Yeah. There's 5,000 mountain lions. So, Obviously, however we're manage them, managing them is working. But mm-hmm. they paint the picture that we're out, out there bloodthirsty rednecks trying to kill every mountain lion that we see or can't get. Like Texans, we don't hunt mountain lions. We, we don't – there are very few. Out in the West Texas mountains, there are guys that can trap them, and there are guys that run, run hounds. But generally speaking, a Texan doesn't shoot a mountain lion unless it's a complete happenstance. Like right. You were deer hunting and you saw one, or you were snaring coyotes and one actually, you know, got mm-hmm. caught in your snare. Th- that's about it. We don't right. we don't have hounds. We're not trying to kill them. It's a cool experience and a nice trophy if you get one, right? Mm-hmm. Once in a lifetime opportunity. Mm-hmm. But uh, they, they these when I went to that commission meeting, they they that's what they that's what they were banking on was trying to paint this picture that we're out there just trying to kill them indiscriminately. It's like most Texans hunters that spend their whole entire life in the outdoors in Texas, we'll never see a mountain lion, no. much less have an opportunity to take one. No, and and while that's still somewhat the case here, uh, you know, we sold roughly 2,500 licenses last year. I think there was just under 500 lions harvested with a 19% success rate. Um, they, they met the quotas in some of the areas because for those that don't know, it's specifically regulated that – a, a geographical area, a big game unit, a lion unit will maybe have 30 lion quota. Maybe it's 15 lion quota, might be eight. Once those quotas are filled up for those areas, those areas close and they, and they're checked on a daily basis. The hunter is required to be able to check those through a phone survey to see if those areas are open or closed. Mm-hmm. Then you have to have that lion inspected within five days. You, you've got to notify them that you killed it within two. And then you, you have to have it inspected, physically inspected within five. And they do, you know, samples out of it, blood samples and the aid structure samples. They want to see the, the entire head and, and the hide and so forth. They took a it's, tooth out of mine. Yeah, they take a tooth out. Uh, between those and bobcats, which are also on the chopping block here, 
and, and because mountain lions are probably more pursued because of a big game animal status, there's more bobcats that are harvested because we have more bobcats, not that we have more people actually out going after bobcats, uh, but we do harvest more bobcats because there's a, there's a component of the fur bearing uh, designation of that. They're fur bearers and mm -hmm. people are, are uh, you know, attracted to harvesting them for the fur collection of the other parts. Uh, but, you know, Bobcats and mountain lions are the most highly regulated stuff that we've got in Colorado. Uh, the requirements, the permits, the testing that you have to have before you can even go. And then the checking and the data and the information that's compiled from CPW. They do that on bighorn sheep and they do that on mountain goats and they do that on moose. They don't do it on deer and elk unless they're talking about chronic wasting disease for some sort of record tracking deal. Mm -hmm. But mountain lions and bobcats are, are, they know each and every one that's harvested. And people say, no, they don't. Before you can legally possess one, before you can take it out of state, it has to have a tag in it, a cat, a bobcat, or a mountain lion. Right. You can't do anything with it on the planet. You can't get it tanned. You can't take it to a taxidermist. You can't do anything because everybody knows exactly what it is. And so when people say they have no idea, that's a bunch of bullshit. They do have idea. They got an exact idea, and there's paperwork and documentation to be able to support that. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, so pat ourselves on the back, you know, as far as managing them appropriately. You, and you have this uh, estimated 5,000 mountain lions. You said 5,000, right? Or is it 25,000? 5, yeah. Five, I mean, it's so 5,000, so, and you said five. So there it was a 10% take of the population ish. Yeah. And, and, and the, the, that seems sustainable to me. 17 to 22% is where they should be before they start getting concerned, depending on if you're looking at males to females, but 17 to 22%. And they're, and they're roughly at they're roughly at 19% total of the, of the, of the actual people that buy licenses, but only 10% of the overall population. Right. Right. Which is definitely sustainable. Um, well, obviously because with, they started out with 200 in 1965, you know, and it's not like they're having, and people need to understand this. They're not like coyotes and bobcats and fox. They're not having litters of 10 or right. eight or six. Typically they have one, two or th maybe three. And, and if it's three, that's an anomaly, but not often do those three often live because you always have the survival of the fittest within the litter. So it's not like they were orphaned. They didn't get killed by, by some hunter because it's illegal to kill a kitten, illegal to kill a female with kittens. Uh, and that goes into the testing part, and that goes into the utiliz utilization of the hounds to be able to identify a female into a tree because of the test that you had to be able to, you know, to ob physically observe what you have in the tree or in that that location where the dogs have actually, you know, pursued that animal into a location to where you, you could identify what it was. I looked at a lot of cats and trees, and uh, the, the houndsman could, you know, sex them just – he he'd climb up there within like six or seven feet of the things, and I'm like, uh -huh. you're crazy. But it's just like the norm for these dudes. Uh -huh. But ah, it's a female. We're gonna let her go, you know. No. And we and rinse and repeat that, and you know. And sometimes you could tell by the track. Sometimes yeah, he, you could yeah. tell. I mean, then, then you run into a female with three kitten tracks or two kitten tracks or whatever. It's like, okay, we're not even gonna run that. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. there's no sense because we already know what it is. Yeah, we found so when we caught the one that I ended up killing. It was very close to an elk. We found the elk kill first, right? Yeah. And then we, the dogs made quick work of that track. It was mm -hmm. very easy. Um, but you know, I don't know if if this if this thing happens with the mountain lions, I go back to burn all my points and then move on. And I don't want that to happen. I don't. I want to keep going to Colorado. I love Colorado. Um. Well, do you that, think do you think though that you guys have enough momentum and we and and this is the other thing, we um, you're talking to a native Texan, mm -hmm. but as part of this greater hunting community, do you think that through these conversations, um, and and just trying to educate the non-hunting public that we can get this thing thwarted when it comes to the ballot in in November? I give us. And, and and not just trying to be optimistic and say, rah, rah, go team, go, you know, whatever, you know, you got a, a one in 26 record and you're going to go on the field and win. No, <laughs> we're we, we outside of the wolf deal, which, and I'm not knocking the wolf guys that, that fought that. I sat on the stakeholder advisory group for 
the wolf management plan. I was appointed to sit on that. So that was that was actually my contribution. Be, and, and there again, well, I'll preface that, because I didn't put my hat into the ring on the anti-wolf campaign, I was elected or selected to sit on, to speak on behalf of the sportsmen and women because I was dealing with all the other ancillary stuff that I talked about through the commission and through the legislature. So I didn't come across as anti-wolf. So they said, well, we got to get some sportsmen. What are we going to get? Well, we can't get the guys that we just turned around and beat in the ballot. Let's right. get this guy who's turned around and trying to beat us on all the other stuff. So I was one of the ones that sat on that. But I I think that everything that we've been successful on since since we, we formulated in 2017 and prior to that, I'm also the president for the Colorado Trappers and Predator Hunters Association. And I sit as a vice chair on the Colorado Wildlife Conservation Project. And No wonder you only got to hunt five days this season. Yeah, and I, there's a, you name all the other boards and committees, and then you get into freaking sideline work and all the other crap that every mm – -hmm. politics is the most unenjoyable part of wildlife conservation and the hunting and fishing issues that we have to deal with. But somebody has to do it, and we're getting some more people that are coming on board that want to help. The the visual component of what we had 10 years ago versus what we have now for participation and engagement is remarkable. I mean, it's almost like the difference between 2.9 million people back in 96 to 5.9 now. Before, it was like three people that would show up, and now it's like 23, or maybe it's 30, or maybe it's 18 at a meeting. That's remarkable turnaround because people are like, we got to pay attention. We got we to gotta figure out how we represent ourselves in a coalition and what we do to get our voices heard on the landscape. And so I think, going back to answering your question, because I keep going down a rabbit hole for you, is right. we're going to win on November 5th, and we're going to win on November 5th, for one, because we're right, for two, because of the momentum that we're building nationwide and in the state, and for three, I think there's, there's, a, there's a tipping point when extremism, whether it's government or otherwise, starts to get out in front of its skis, and even people that are sitting in the middle go, well, how can that be right? Mm -hmm. And I really start to think that there might be a little bit of buyer's remorse on the wolf deal, but the extremism of, look, we've got a fur ban going on in Denver this year where it's up to the city of Denver, the city and county of Denver voters to vote on the, the, the sale of fur. Oh my but God. the way Are it these reads, Cable, that, so they're going to go vote and they're going to drive to vote within the leather seats in their Tesla or whatever it is. While the which, while, by the way, won't run when it's below, you know, when well, it's while they're wearing their cowboy hat, outside. while <laughs> right. they're wearing their cowboy hat with beaver felt fur, that will be banned. <laughs> you won't be able to sell a cowboy hat in the city of Denver. You won't be able to buy any fly fishing material or tied flies or fishing lures with any fur on it in the city of Denver. You won't be able to buy Native American artifacts or, or Native American artwork at the March powwow or the Indian market in the city of Denver. Then they're trying to ban the one lamb slaughterhouse in the city of Denver. It's been here for 85 years. They want to get rid of it. They want to get rid of the fur in the state. They want to get rid of harvest and mountain lions and bobcats. That's where I get into the extremism side where people can start to go, okay, look, I don't hunt mountain lions and bobcats, but I can't buy a cowboy hat. I can't right. turn around and get any fishing lures. I can't go to Bass Pro that's in Denver or Cabela's that's in Denver and buy the stuff that I normally buy. What am I supposed to use synthetic? I can't go to Indian Market and, and March Pow Wow to watch the the Native Americans with their cultural side of things to where I I can't do any of that. Oh, by the way, I can't buy lamb because I, I like to eat lamb, lamb chops. Chop, lamb chops last night. They were awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's where the extremism comes in to where the, I think, I I really honestly believe that even with the makeup and the and the of our blue and red politics system, that the majority of the people are going to go. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> Come on, on every single aspect of my life that I didn't think it was going to affect me, now this is going to affect me because there there is an intersection, there is a crossover, and I think I say this often: people are not stupid; they're ignorant about specific issues and circumstances and topics. I don't think they're stupid, and I think once they tar spar start putting two and two together, I think that they'll start to realize, well, it might not affect me, but my grandson fishes, right. my uncle hunts, my next door neighbor likes to freaking. We had lamb chops at his barbecue last Fourth of the What the hell? Yeah, yeah. Well, so I, I think, think we're gonna win. I'm glad to hear that.
Because like I said early in the conversation, I think it's the most important issue that we're facing in 2024 because of the fallout and domino effect that inevitably will infiltrate. My, I mean, my name, the state that I spend the second most amount of time hunting in is New Mexico. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, God, if Colorado does this, like, well, New Mexico is just gonna, they're going to be running to sign up and say, choose us. Let's do this. You know, look, look um, what New Mexico already did. They, 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 they banned trapping on public mm -hmm. land through the state legislature. Yeah. There's the mountain lion and the, and the and the bear issues that are trying to be brought up down there. They've got gun issues from their governor, just like what we've got here. Their general assembly, which just concluded, I think they get a 30 day 30 day general assembly session every other year. Well, first of all, I'd like to know why Colorado has to have one every year for five months, and New Mexico could get away with 30 days every other year. Right. I mean, I would. <laughs> You know what I would give for a 30 day deal? I could actually hunt. I could actually recreate. I could actually go on vacation uh, as opposed well, to trying to be a politician. You alluded to the, the tipping point, though, where it starts to affect everyone's like, wait, this, I can't buy flies. Why? Mm -hmm. Part of the reason why I moved to Colorado was so I could go fishing. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah. But you see it with the DEI crap and corporations that for the last seems like five years, we're all about this. DEI. Well, it turns out that's not a really good way to run a business. Mm -hmm. And they're starting to distance from that and say, mm -hmm. maybe we should hire based on accolades and merit yep. instead of skin color or sex. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, in universities, I mean, the Harvard university just fired their, uh, their Dean um, for, you know, who, who by all accounts was hired on a DEI scale. Like, yep. And then proved to be very underqualified for the job. Yep. And so I think the, the pendulum is swinging back on that. And I can only hope that, you know, compare that to our way of life and that it's the same thing. We've, we've reached the breaking point. And now Look we're going to go back to scientific-based wildlife management. And if it hurts your feelings, you know what? We don't really give a damn. Mm -hmm. Look at, the, look at the, the, the oil and gas industry or the renewable the renewable resources look what the biden administration just came out and said oh wait wait we're not going to make everybody do the electric vehicles as fast as what we originally intended because uh, there's there's some pushback there's pushback from the industry there's pushback from people's ability to to do things for their livelihood um so but and it's also an election year now mm -hmm. i wouldn't be surprised if biden sticks in there long enough this is on the national level, obviously, but sticks in there long enough, and he 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 gets to be president. He's going to turn around and reverse and say, "Well, you know, we decided that uh, you know that 2030 is the good time. It's not going to be 2035 now or 2040. 2030 is, is that that was the original yeah. intent, and that's what we're going to go with." I think people see through that. They see through the sales pitch of modern day politics and the hypocrisy that is you know given to us on so many different levels. That if it starts to affect them, what do you mean I won't be able to go recreate? I can't go mm -hmm. ski? I can't buy fishing flies? You're going to bring wolverines in up here, which is fine. I don't have a problem with wolverines. But then you're going to close the forest down. We can't snowmobile. There's no logging up there because now there's wolverines there. Or wolves moved into the ski area to have their litter of pups. So there's no May or there's no March or April skiing because the wolves are there. We, uh, I'm in a yeah. conflict resolution business. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean we kill everything. But people don't want squirrels in their house. They yeah. don't they eat in their wires. They don't want bats in their belfry. They don't want gophers in their garden. They don't want snakes in their cellar. They damn sure want to go skiing. I'll tell you that. Uh, we go to. We've gone to Durango. This will be our third uh, spring break in a row with my family's been in purgatory. And part of me, I'm not gonna lie, and I hate to say this about Colorado, part of me feels dirty for spending money there with the politics, and I'm just like, but you know, it is affordable. <laughs> it's a beautiful state, and there's so many pluses, but. I, I'm like, maybe I should go to a different state and spend my hard-earned dollar where I agree more with the politics. But you can I go don't to California. Wanna... They got good skiing out here. Oh, yeah, you know? would be not <laughs> dead in California. No, yeah. No, no way in hell. Um, but, yeah, so we're going, we're going back there in March for spring break. And mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. I hope that I, hope that I don't – because I don't feel like I'm alone in that mindset. It's like a lot of people I talk to are like, yeah, well, we've just been going to Colorado for so long. We don't want to go somewhere else, you know? Yeah. And, and but what if they closed purgatory because there was a, a wolf den on the slopes? Mm -hmm. Can you imagine that mm -hmm. the lo the loss of revenue. Yeah, there's you know science based wildlife management is a, is adaptive because of changing landscapes and a variety of different circumstances. And I say this you know the the depredation issues and and drought 
and, and throw climate in there to some degree because, you know, it's like the blizzard, the, the winter storms that we had last year in the Northwest. That was part of climate. Whether it's climate change? No, I don't really think so. I mean, they used to have those things over and over and over and over and over, you know, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Uh, and even the 70s, I remember being up there in the Peon Space in, uh, in the 70s, and, and we were snowed in for four days. Uh, I mean, a track machine had to come get you out because of the amount of snow. Wildlife science is adaptive. You have to figure out a way to be nimble and call an audible. And anybody who was a Denver Broncos fan and Peyton Manning, you know, maybe, maybe it's calling an Omaha, uh, but th- to figure out what is necessary, not just for today, but tomorrow, the next year, five years from now. And then when something else happens in the meantime, Hey, you call an Omaha and you turn around and figure out something else out. That's not what the antis profess. Theirs is stop it all, no matter what, get off the landscape, don't harvest it, don't manage it, don't do anything. It doesn't matter what happens to it, because as long as you're not doing it, we think that's good enough, whether it's there or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's just like and you, you brought up the Biden administration who has not been a friend to hunting. We've lost millions and millions of acres in Alaska. Um, I mean, that's fact. Like we keep sustainable. That's the rewilding uh, process. Okay, so the point is, Deb Howland, when she was appointed Secretary of the Interior, organizations like SCI asked her for a commitment to no net loss hunting, which she wouldn't give. And the reason why is because she is not a conservationist. Yep. She rewilding is, the thirty by thirty. You know, thirty percent of all lands you know, given back into a conservation deal by twenty thirty, and fifty percent by twenty fifty. That's yeah. a fifty fifty by fifty process. People don't pay attention to that because they hear the word conservation. Well, conservation, in my mind, it should include people because we're here. That doesn't right. mean that we're kicked off the landscape. Do you, and does it, doesn't it, does mean... it annoy you when people say, well, they were here first? Because nothing – I'm like, well, guess what? Well, this isn't 1820. Well, I get – because because of our business. People say, <laughs> they were here well, first. you know, the they were here, were here first. first. And I'm like, I'm like, no, 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 no. I used to hunt and trap this property before houses were here and there was no prairie dogs. There was no prairie dogs until all the houses were built and you gave a sanctuary up and you created this mosaic effect of a landscape to where plague wouldn't come in and knock them all out. And then the coyotes moved in to chase the prairie dogs. But I hunted and trapped this and there was no prairie dogs here then, which meant there was no burrowing owls and there was no black footed ferrets. There wasn't any of that stuff. So don't tell me they were here first. Right. They weren't. Right. Right. But the difference is the word is preservation. That's what Deb Howland is. And preservation is what you described, where you just say, no hunting, no trapping, let the animals figure it out. That's, pres- that's the preservation mindset. It's a failed concept. It will not work. My grandma used to do, do a canning, uh, and, and she made preserves. They called them preserves because they, they preserved them to sit on the shelf but my grandpa always said, no, we're conserving them because my intent is to eat that damn thing so you can make right. more. And so <laughs> there was an argument between the two that one was preserves and the other was was conserve. And and she always preserved them. But by by the next spring, they were conserved and gone. So Right. That's, <laughs> so. A, good, that's a good analogy. I like that. <laughs> um, well, so, Dan, in, in wrapping up here, like I said, this is the most important thing that we're facing as a hunting community in 2024 i am excited that not only you but also naomi was uh very optimistic in that conversation that through just educating the general public and hasn't i mean we lost the wolf ballot by 49 point something to 51 point something yeah that's not a lot that's not a big margin all we need to get is to the other side of 50 and we're good one tenth of one percent will get us across the finish line, but at this level, cable, I really believe that it would not be out of the realm of possibilities if we wouldn't be looking at a three or a five or a seven percent margin on our side, because I think people have uh, woken up. Uh-huh. I think people are starting to pay attention to the overreach and the extremism, and uh, you know, for just looking at just look at the, the website engagement that we've gotten you know, through the analytics side of things and what people are paying attention to. Yeah, they're going to the donate button, savethehuntcolorado.com. I got to throw that out. If you want to help, go to savethehuntcolorado.com and help us fight the enemy. People are going there like mad. But those same people then leave that and they go to 
the initiative page for the initiative itself and see what the language and the wording is. Or they come to the initiative side to look and, and educate themselves and then they read and then they go from there to the donate page. And then we know we got some, you know, they sit and they go and they come back and they go back and forth and they're trying to, you know, decipher how full of crap we are and they go to somebody else's website and maybe they're looking at the opposition. But people are becoming well enough informed about the facts and the facts are laid out by the science-based managers within Colorado Parks and Wildlife that have specific great information out there that we've got on our Instagram and we go on the Facebook and we've got on the website about mountain lion management in Colorado, the fact sheets, the videos of the data of the West Slope mountain lion management plan, what's going on with mountain lion populations as a whole, what's happening on the East Slope mountain lion management plan, the, the, the studies that are going on on bobcat management. People are becoming educated about that stuff. And then we could direct them to other resources, whether it's Colorado Parks and Wildlife or other components that, but you don't get that from the opposition. You go to the opposition and it says, no, 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 they're wrong. No, 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 they're wrong. They're liars. That's, that's their stick is they lie. They deceive. They play a smoke and mirror shell game with people's minds. And what we're hoping to do is capitalize on people's ability to find out facts and data and make an educated decision when it comes time on November 5th. And to do that from our side, we have to have funding to be able to go punch for punch tit for tat with the enemy. And I would like to say that we're, we're considering this to be a 15 round in round three or four. We have won all, all of the first rounds through the secretary of state, the title board, the Supreme court. They are in the process of gathering signatures at this point in time. If they get those signatures by July 5th, then those signatures have to be certified and they'll likely end up in, end up on the ballot. But we've done all the appropriate measures that we needed to th- for the first part of this process. But we've done that on the backs of sportsmen and women, the industry, organizations throughout the United States. We've taken donations in from 50 states now. I've gone to all these shows that I mentioned, Sheep Show. We've had guys at, at uh, SCI, the Turkey Federation. We just came back from uh, Western Hunt. We were at SHOT Show. We're doing banquets and conventions and seminars and demonstrations and cattlemen's association stuff. And that's not just happening in state. It's a mass flow of stuff that's happening out of state. And it's guys like you and others that we've been fortunate enough to be able to ride their coattails on to get this message out. We're We're going to win. Yeah, We're we're going to win. We're going to kick the crap out of them and it's going to piss them off. So I I do wanted to point out, I want to point out uh, your large carnivore program lead is not Anti mountain lion hunting, Mark. Uh, what's Mark his last Vieira. name? Mark Vieira. Mark Vieira. Yes. And at that commission meeting, which I watched uh, his presentation, he's pro- he's like, "Hey, there's value in these houndsmen. They're doing a great job helping us, right?" So yep. that's good that he's on our side. Yep. Um, the 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 thing that I think was a little bit of a misstep, which is which was what got me fired up on the whole thing because I've hunted the spring mountain lion season in Colorado. Yep. Was we, we lost that, and we lost electronic calls. And I know only one or two guys kill mountain lions with electronic calls every year, but guess what? We lost opportunity, and I hate to see losing opportunity. And more importantly, like I just thought the timing of it with what we're fighting in November potentially uh, was mis- a miscalculation. And I wanted to get your thought on that because I expressed this to Naomi, and she was, you know, she was very much involved with that as well. Um, but I was like, this the op- the optics of losing this right now in this this very perilous time. I, I just was like, couldn't we have done this at a different date, like after this ballot initiative? And I think maybe no. his intentions were good, but it it kind of well. The the kicker is, those conversations started in April of last year, right? And to go through multi step processes when a commission only meets every other month, and you have to address specific things on specific categories or chapters of the regulations at specific times of the year, those were being talked about in preparation for what's going on, what went on at the January commission meeting. It wasn't their fault that the initiative was dropped on September 22nd last year. It's like, okay, so do we just scrap everything we've been talking about? And that's why I referenced the mountain lion management side of things and all management of wildlife has to be adaptive. You have to be nimble. If they would have altered their course of action, in my opinion, just because somebody was throwing a bunch of hubba bubba bullshit out there, I think it would have been, it would have been ill-advised, but it also would have played into the opposition. 
because now you're now you're doing what you what you say you need to do because they decide they're going to turn around and throw crap at the wall. If if that's the case, then maybe we sh- shouldn't be doing anything at any level because they're always throwing crap at the wall. And mm-hmm. I think there there was there was an ex executive director of the Department of Natural Resources multiple years back, and he said, uh, and I'm trying to think verbatim, there's never a good time to try to change politics because politics is always trying to change a good time. And, and, and so, so looking at a, looking at a management objective of what CPW had done, they got done with the April season last year. And in April, they started talking about how do we modify this for the next year? They don't meet in April. They only meet they don't, last year. They met in June and July no meeting in August, then they met in September, no meeting in October, then they met in November, no meeting in December, then they met in January. With all the plethora of things on the landscape for them to deal with, and because of the chapter of big game mountain lion management, it was it was pertinent to do it regulatory in January. Well, like I say, they dropped the initiative on us in September. But keep in mind, the initiative has nothing to do with Colorado Parks and Wildlife, period. Right. Yeah. That's the ballot. That's between the voters and the and and the proponents. So CBW is an arm over here doing management stuff. And granted, maybe it was bad for optics, but if they're going to worry about what everybody else is going to throw at the wall at any given time, we would never get anything done, whether it's bighorn sheep, coyotes, green wing teal, or anything, because somebody's still going to sit and gripe about something during that process. Mm. Yeah, no, I agree. I But I think that, you know, and this is getting into the weeds a little bit, but I think maybe (laughs) the licensing system needs to be updated. If they're saying, which was my understanding, like not enough people were utilizing the spring season to warrant its continued existence. It wasn't helping us meet our management goals. Okay. Well, but your license doesn't really, you know, if you're, if you get it April, but then you tag out like, and then you're done for the, the winter season. That doesn't really do it. Like maybe you should have a spring season and then also have the tag, you know, a different tag for. Well, see, but that comes into a statutory obligation for the legislature as well. So, yeah, you could do that. Mm -hmm. But because of the way that we buy licenses in the state of Colorado, it's not from January 1st to to January, uh, January 1st to December 31st. It actually is from April 1st to March 31st because of our license structure when you can apply for big game licenses. And then when you have to purchase a qualifying license to be able to get into that draw. So that qualifying license that you buy the first part of March for the upcoming season is if you, if you buy it in March, it's not necessarily good for March. It's good starting April 1st. The April season was part of the following season, not of the previous season. And that's where people, it's like, well, they they dropped the extension of the season. No, they didn't. They dropped the the first month of the season is what they did. The first month of the ongoing se- uh, upcoming season is what they ended up dropping. And just for statistic purposes, because normally I I like like to make sure I'm covering my bases on stuff. Right. So the purgatory, the Southeast Plains, the L17 had a three year average harvest of 14, including an open April season. The harvest threshold is 28. And the harvest limit was 25. That season has not closed prior to the April season because nobody was fulfilling what they had or what they would have been included in that early season. One of the misspeaks that actually happened during that 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 meeting that you're referencing in January was the illusion that there was a ton of people out there utilizing that as a management tool. And the majority of the people weren't. They were out there utilizing it as an opportunity to pursue lions without harvest. And people even said this on a hot mic. And people can argue this to. Well, what's wrong with that? I don't have a problem with that. We don't have a pursuit season. Well, but what's wrong with it? Like we we don't have one. It's not in statute. That's harassment. If you're not going to do it with the intent of harvesting or attempting to harvest, and that was the statement that was made. This is when we train our dogs. Okay. We don't have a training season. Uh, okay, well that that might be a problem for or well, a then, discussion then for another day, right? Well, that's like, a conversation for another you day. Should but, be able but, to train your dogs so that they're more effective at tracking cats. Did the houndsmen come to that argument though? 
Not, you know? Well, that's that's the thing. The houndsmen. Okay, so, the houndsmen so I mean, for, and, and it's not unique to Colorado, right? I mean, the houndsmen have been taking it on the chin for a long time because houndsmen aren't very well organized, generally exactly. speaking. Yeah, and I now, think now maybe we I want to change that, but well, and and the, uh, because and, you know what, it's going to have to change because they keep losing. Like they're the low hanging fruit. They lose here. They lose. They lose in California. They lose. They, they they're they're literally the first on the chopping block. Them and trapping. Houndsman and trapping. It's like one A, one B. Who do you want to whack their heads off first? And that's why that's why I've been so adamant about trying to get those guys on board and making sure they're part of the equation. Mm-hmm. When we won, when we won Senate Bill Thirty One in February of twenty twenty two, it was me wrangling up all the houndsmen to turn around and get them together to go to the Capitol to be able to defeat Senate Bill Thirty One. The statement that I made to those guys on on February fourth, the day after our victory, is you guys need to get your shit together. You got to get organized. Okay. Mm-hmm. September 22nd comes along of 2023, 18 months later, Houndsman didn't do anything for that 18 months. He didn't do anything. So I made the phone calls. This is coming up. Well, what are we going to do? How are we going to do this? You guys haven't got your shit together. You haven't been to a meeting since then. You haven't done any structure. You went out and chased lions. Right. You went out and helped with some studies, but you didn't turn around and sit down with the decision makers that are going to chastise you and hang you by the nutsack because you're not there at the table. Now they're at the table. Cody Lodestro, the vice president for the United Houndsmen of Colorado. Justin Anglovich, the president for the United Houndsmen of Colorado. They're at the table now. I will give them credit for coming on and jumping on board with what we're trying to do to support them and their efforts. But when they came to this, they'll be the first to admit that they didn't have all their ducks in a row to make sure that they were crossing their T's and dotting their I's because they hadn't been part of the equation outside of the hound part of it, but not the politics part of it. For the previous 18 months, the previous two years, the previous five years. Decades. I've been to every commission meeting except for four for the last 15 years, and I never saw a houndsman turn around and go to one, period. Mm-hmm. And so we could talk about semantics of things, but I will I will put my flag in the, in the ground and say, if you're dealing with people that are making decisions on your behalf and you're not showing up to talk to those people and you don't know their names, you don't know what district you live in, you don't your, know your county commissioner or your senator, that's not Parks and Wildlife's problem. They do the management side of things, and they got to hear from the public. And if they're only hearing from the anti side of the public and nobody who's actually boots on the ground, then they're going to be forced to make the decisions based upon what the commission decides. And if it goes to the legislature, well, it's a crapshoot. It's a crapshoot. I think part of it is sportsmen in general, more often than not, are going to lean red. And red means, hey, I just want to live – my life will be left alone, right? <laughs> yeah, it, it is. Like, and it's it's this foreign thing of like, why are you trying to tell me how to live my life if it doesn't affect you personally? Because I don't like I don't do that. Like I don't believe no. in that. Like no. live your life, whatever yeah. you have one life to live. As long as it makes sense, like yeah. do it. I don't care. You're 18 years old, you want to call yourself a, a boy and wear a dress, you know, or a, a girl and wear a dress and you're a boy, fine. I don't whatever. Do that. It makes you happy. Mm-hmm. Now don't do it to my kids. Don't don't mm-hmm. put that BS in their mind. Right. But if that's what makes you happy at 18. You're an adult. You can make your own decisions. By God, more power to you. Um, but I think we just, you know, this that's how we've – and you said it way on, early in the conversation. For so long, we as sportsmen, and not just houndsmen, but as sportsmen, we've been reactionary. Yep. Like, and now we're, we have to be proactive. We have to take the fight to them and be like, well, how can we stop them from doing this in the future? I don't know. Maybe we win, and we will win in November. I'm going to say we're going to win. Um, you've got me on team win. I got got my pom poms out, mm-hmm. Dan. Here we go. We're going to do it. They're not going to stop. They're going to come back again. Oh yeah, again. but again. but here's the deal, Cable. With our organization that we created, when we had that initiative drop on on September 22nd, I had hired the legal team and the strategy company on September 25th. It had to be done before October 6th, or we would have missed the opportunity to file an appeal. Not another organization on the flipping planet was structured or well-financed enough at that particular time to do exactly what we did. That's proaction. We yeah. didn't react. We waited for them to drop it. But we were immediately able to turn around and say, you want to come on? I already got my gloves on. You want to go yeah. tip for tap? We can do that. If we didn't do what we did, and I'm not just taking credit. I'm explaining the process. Yeah. If we didn't do what we did, they would have been gathering signatures legitimately because there would have been no appeals process. They would have been gathering signatures on November 1st with their language, with their terminology, with their message to the general public. They would have done it all the way through Thanksgiving, the Christmas holidays, Black Friday, all the time when everybody's going shopping in that freaking ski area. They could have gone there and got their signature. I think they'd have gotten their signatures done that they needed 
125,000 signatures, which they had six months to do from the time that they would have gotten the, the title affirmed, they would have been done by the 1st of February. We oh. halted those efforts, changed the language, and they didn't start gathering signatures until the 4th of February. Now they have till the 5th of July to be able to turn around and get that done. But that was pro-action. Yep. The Houndsmen weren't part of those proactive measures. The Elk Foundation wasn't part of those proactive measures. Now they're all jumping on as far as the team is concerned, and we're putting people in places and money and positions and stuff. But there has to be some foresight on the fight. If you're going to advocate for what you say you're going to do, then turn around and belly up to the bar and say, I'm in here and I'm the baddest son of a bitch, and I want somebody to turn around and challenge me. We haven't right. done that as a community. No, no. It goes back to that mindset of, of like our values. It's like, I just want to be left alone. Right. I mean, yeah. generally speaking, just, <laughs> hey, what I'm doing, I, it's not affecting you. Just leave me, leave me the hell alone. Yeah. Let me just do what I'm doing here. It's, it's actually good for wildlife, by the way, if you look at it. Um, but um, that's, that's neither here nor there. Um, man, give us that donate. And I haven't donated yet, but when we get off the phone, I'm going to make a contribution. Uh, and it doesn't matter how big or small. You donate what you can, but realize that we're all in this together. This is as organized as it gets. And, uh, I so I'm gonna, I'm gonna give I'm gonna give I'm gonna give our deal, but I want to give uh, some kudos and some praise to a couple companies, sure. if you don't mind. Absolutely. SaveTheHuntColorado.com is where you can go and donate, and you can get educated about this particular subject matter. <clears throat> Excuse me. SaveTheHuntColorado.com. When we just got done doing our podcast in Western Hunt Expo in Salt Lake City, we did a podcast with Go Hunt. And Go Hunt offered on the podcast that if you go to their website, and I'm giving them a plug because this is a remarkable deal that I appreciate you letting me do. Sure. For $149 insider package membership that you get, if you go to the checkout on Go Hunt and you put in CRWM into the code, they are going to donate $100 to CRWM. And then Lorenzo, the owner of Go Hunt, is going to donate another hundred dollars. So if somebody gets the go hunt package, the insider package for 149 punches the CRWM in there, CRWM is going to get $200 for you to be able to get what you maybe wanted to get at some point in time, or maybe decided to pull the trigger mm -hmm. on top of that Spartan forge a couple of weeks ago offered. If you get their $20 for anybody that donates $20 to CRWM, then you get a Spartan forge membership. So what I'm saying is it's, and those are just two of the many that are coming out of the woodwork from the industry that are saying, we don't have to make money off this gates. We want to help support. And to be able to do that, we want to give people something in return mm -hmm. to help incentivize them to go to your website, to be able to donate. And then we can kick money in. Josh Smith with Montana Knife kicked in $5,000, trying to come up with another program, giving us some kudos. We've got Nosler, Kuyu, Quiet Cat, Yeti, all kicking money in in some form or fashion. People are starting to see that their businesses that they support are kicking into this cause, which is a monumental effort in itself. But that's just a few of the ones that I mentioned that, that, that are actually doing it. Mm -hmm. This is a movement, Cable, and I can tell you that I think people are saying enough is enough. Let's put our flag in the sand. Let's draw a line in the concrete, not in the sand, because then that can be brushed out. Right. Let's support save the hunt, Colorado.com. Let's kick the crap out of the extremists in Colorado and let's help them prop up the efforts to create a blueprint and a roadmap to help New Mexico and to help Wyoming and to help Arizona or maybe help Ohio or whatever it is. This is a conservation effort where people are starting to pay attention to the North American model of wildlife conservation and science-based wildlife management. And they're sick and tired of watching things be eroded and degraded and bastardized and marginalized. And I honestly believe that when we're victorious here, everybody that participates in this process can go, I helped in Colorado, as opposed to saying, look what happened in Colorado. Yeah. And, and here's the blueprint for what's coming down whatever they're trying to do in my state whatever they're forcing down my throat yep. that i didn't ask for that i don't want that's going to affect my way of life affect my daily life maybe affect my ability to put food in the freezer whatever it is yeah here's the blueprint we were a part of it working in colorado let's do the same thing in our state i don't want people in january of 25 
at any level to look back in November of 24 like they did in January of 21 from November of 20 on the wolf issue and go, we should have done something different. I want them to look back in January of 25 to November of 24 and go, this is what we did different. Mm -hmm. That's what I, I think. Want. That's the difference between the 2020 deal and where we are right now is, yeah, I had conversations with people, but there wasn't a, there wasn't a, oh, by the way, where do we go donate? How can we be a part of this? It wasn't exactly. a movement. It was, it was a education thing. It was like, well, let's tell people about this because it's, it's coming. But just the telling people didn't. It's not good it, enough. No, it, it wasn't it, good it, enough. Nobody in Ohio or Texas can vote here to turn right. around and sway. The, we need everybody else's. I had one guy at the, at the Hunt Expo. What are you going to do with my money? And, and he, he catches me as I'm walking through 12 million people to get to another booth to do a podcast. He said, what are you going to do with my money? I'm thinking, I don't even know who the hell you are. I said, well, I said, well, we've hired a campaign strategist, we, you know, we've got attorneys, we're, we're doing, we're doing a proactive campaign. This is a political campaign. And he, and he goes, yeah, but what are you going to do with the money? And I said, well, to, to, I don't mean to be rude. I got to cut you short here, but to cut it short, I need your money to be able to turn around and pay to advertise to the target audience. Who's going to vote on this from the nine County Denver Metro area from El Paso County to Fort Collins within 25 miles east or west of the I-25 corridor, and without money from all around the country, I can't afford to advertise on that to that group on an election year. Mm -hmm. And he looks at me, he reaches in his wallet, he says, here's $100 in the business card, I will send you more. No. Well, I gave him you know, a 30-second spiel, he gives me 100 bucks. If I could do that all day long, I still wouldn't raise enough money. But if they go to the website, non-voters, non-residents can turn around and contribute to this cause Look how much money non-resident sportsmen and women put into our application process. You have to buy a not a qualifying license for thirty-nine to fifty-four dollars. You got to pay for preference points. You got an application fee. How about just give us a little bit of the money that you're putting in so you can apply for a license, and then you get this, you know, a participation trophy for a fishing license that you're never going to use, but you have to buy one to apply. Mm -hmm. How about support save the hunt Colorado.com for something we can turn around and try to sustain wildlife management in Colorado and wildlife populations in perpetuity. And you guys could be part of the process to help us out and making sure that happens. Right on, right on. Well, Dan, I appreciate it, man. Thanks for all of your efforts. Like you, I mean, it's not a thankless job because you, you, you know why you're doing it. Somebody has to do it. So uh, I, I appreciate that as someone who loves to come to your state and, and outdoor recreate, hunt, fish, and ski, and everything else. I'd like to continue to do that. And that's why, for me, it's like, well, shoot, let's let's make that happen. Um, well, and that, that's what that, you guys are doing. So thank you very much. I know your your, your time has been in high demand lately. <laughs> yeah. uh, so thanks for making time for us. And, uh, yeah, uh, I'm a big fan of what y'all are doing. You come up this way, you're always welcome, and uh, buy you whiskey or dinner or whatever, but uh, you got a, you got a place to stay if you need to. All right, man. Well, thanks again, buddy. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Take care.